the second round of teaching that I have on the parables of Jesus under the category Heart After God Bible Teaching Ministry. And these teachings are primarily for the pastors and leaders in the churches in Siaya, Kenya, but they're not solely for those people. Uh, they're for anybody and everyone that really wants to study God's Word in depth, that wants to become a better student of God's Word. And um, that's, that's what this is all about. We're, we're studying the parables of Jesus, which is about one-third of all of his teaching. And we want to understand how do we accurately interpret the parables of Jesus. For the pastors and leaders in Kenya, um, the parables of Jesus, in that it's one-third of his teaching, is a substantial amount of the New Testament. And as Danny Gilbert and I are looking to uh, teach and train and mentor uh, the pastors in Kenya, one of our chief responsibilities is to teach them uh, accurate principles of Bible study and interpretation uh, so that they can grow and so that their churches can grow as well. And so that's really the heart of all of this. Uh, I forgot to mention in my first installment, I wanted to give uh, a hearty thanks to my dear friend Mark Biasotti, who is my partner in ministry in this video teaching. So I, I sit here and I teach, but Mark does the back end of the teaching. He's the one that edits the video, works on the sound, puts the graphics in there as well. And so Mark, I hope you'll put a picture of yourself um, up there right about now and uh, so people can see who you are and uh, I just appreciate your partnership with me in this ministry and um, with that let's dedicate this time uh, to our Lord in prayer so would you join me in prayer and in Luo in Kenya I believe it's Walem right and so that means let us pray so let's pray uh, I'm gonna say come Holy Spirit in Luo be Rojo Maler and in uh, Swahili, it's Njo Roho Ntakatifu. Come, Holy Spirit, and open our eyes, open our ears, open our hearts. You are our teacher, and we ask that you would now lead us and guide us into your truth. Give us your understanding, and may our lives bring glory and honor to the Father and the Son. May we be changed and transformed as we study your word now. And then, Father, we pray that you would help us to be your blessing to everybody that we come into contact with. And for those of us who are, are teaching and preaching your word, let us do so in the fear of God, with reverence, with accuracy, and with expectation that um, it will perform its work in those who believe. And so we set ourselves an expectation as we teach and preach your word that lives will be changed and transformed and that uh, the unsaved will will come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and as their Savior. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, let me give one more greeting to my brothers and sisters in Siaya, Kenya. Oyaware Ahinya, which uh, for those that you don't speak, uh, those of you that don't speak Luo, that is good morning. And I could say Misawa Ahinya, um, and then even more than that, Nisai Ogwedu, which means God bless you, and Opak Roth, which means praise the Lord. Well, I'm ready to begin. And um, so in the last teaching, we left off uh, on the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God. So in your notes, in paragraph number one, I asked the question, what is the kingdom of God. In Matthew, uh, the kingdom of God is referred to as the kingdom of heaven. We ask that question, what is the kingdom of God? Because throughout Jesus' parables, he tells us the kingdom of heaven is like. Over and over and over, the kingdom of heaven is like this. It's like a seed. It's like a, a, a woman who searches for a coin. Um, We'll see that in depth, how often Jesus uses that. It's called a simile, the kingdom of heaven is like. So before we get to the parables, we need to settle first, 
what the kingdom of God is. Now, the short answer to that question uh, is that it is the rule and reign of God. That's paragraph number one in your notes under this category, the kingdom of God, an, over, an overview. The kingdom of God is the rule and reign of God, both in this age and in the age to come. Jesus is the true king over all the earth. And so in this section, we're going to get, we're going to get in depth into the word of God. And so if you'll turn with me to the first uh, scriptural reference in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 5. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 5, uh, where John gives a greeting from uh, the Father and from the Holy Spirit, and then from Jesus Christ, he says, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead. By the way, that Greek word, uh, prototokos, simply means highest, the most exalted. It doesn't mean that he is the um, he is a, a creature less than God. It's, it's really a title of all those who have been raised from the dead. Jesus Christ is supreme. That's the best way to understand that. So he refers to him as the firstborn of the dead. He's referring back to his resurrection. Now watch this. He says, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. And yet, he's not sitting on an earthly throne yet. Nevertheless, he is ruling over the kings of all the earth. Now, we might say, well, wow, we wish he would, he would, he would bring a more assertive rule and reign, don't we? we? We desire that the kings of the earth, the judges, the rulers, the governors, uh, so on and so forth, we desire that they do what is right before God. Isn't that right? And Jesus is ruling and reigning. He knows what he's doing, but he also gives the leaders of the world free will. And the Holy Spirit is convicting them day and night to do what's right. But also the way Jesus rules and reigns is through our prayers. And so not, you know, if, if a ruler does the wrong thing and we're praying for them, that's not our fault. That's his fault. But nevertheless, we are to pray. 1 Timothy 2 verse 5 tells us that we're to make prayer, ongoing prayer for the kings and, and rulers and governors and all those who are in authority so that we may lead a peaceful and righteous life in all quietness and dignity. That's a paraphrase. So Jesus rules and reigns over the affairs of man, but he gives man free will. He aids man in his free will through his word and by his spirit and through the prayers of the church and through circumstances. But a time is coming when Jesus Christ, when his spiritual reign will become an earthly reign as well. We're going to talk about that more. But in the Gospels, he is teaching his disciples what is the kingdom of God like. He, in teaching his disciples that, he is going to clear up some, some wrong understanding of the kingdom of God and wrong teaching. And of course, he is going to give accurate teaching about what the kingdom of God is already all about. That brings us to paragraph number two. <laughs> now, now, in this present evil age, if you'll turn with me to Galatians chapter four, uh, Galatians chapter, I'm sorry, Galatians chapter one, Let's see, Galatians chapter 1 and verse 4, Paul calls this present age an evil age. Notice with me, Galatians chapter 1 and verse 4, he says, speaking of Jesus, who gave himself for our sins so that he might rescue us from this present evil age according to to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forevermore. Amen. Now, and then if you'll turn with me to Ephesians chapter 2, and uh, verses 1 and 2. Ephesians 2, and verses 1 and 2. I think in, in Luo it's Joe Epheso. 
And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, that is of this age, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Those who are not born again, the Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul calls them sons of disobedience. And he says in verse 3, among them we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, include, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. All the people around you, beloved, that know, don't know Jesus Christ, the biblical view of, of their status, sons of disobedience and children of wrath. That means we have to have a heart to share the gospel with them so that they can move out of darkness and into God's marvelous light. And are for the pastors and leaders in Kenya, are you equipping your people to give their testimony, to preach the gospel, to, to share the gospel with their loved ones and their co-workers and their neighbors and so on and so forth? Are you challenging your people to preach the gospel? Are you yourself preaching the gospel to those that don't know the Lord, that to those that don't yet know the Lord? Are you sharing the gospel uh, with them? So this, this present age is an evil age. And the kingdom of God is largely concealed. It's largely concealed because it's entered into spiritually. And we find that in John chapter 3 and enjoyed by faith in Jesus Christ. If you'll turn with me to John chapter 3, I just was doing a, a, a wonderful study in John 3 only a few days ago and just had an incredible time studying that passage. And um, so in John chapter 3 verse 1, now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we, speaking on behalf of the Pharisees, we know that you have come from God as a teacher. So it's not that they, they didn't know, it's that they knew and they rejected him. It's just an incredible insight that John gives us. And he, he explains why. He says, for no one can do the signs that you do unless God is with him. And Jesus appears to interrupt him. In verse 3, Jesus answered and said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you. In Hebrew, that would be amen, amen. But the Jewish teachers, the rabbis of the time, would, would say amen as as the beginning of an important statement, but no one ever used the word Amen, Amen. So be it, so be it. That is what comes after those two words is extremely important. Only Jesus in the Jewish culture at that time, only Jesus was known to have said, truly, truly, I say to you. But again, the, the he would have been spoken in speaking in, in Hebrew or Aramaic, and the word is very similar in both languages, amen, amen. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, or the Greek word can be translated born from above, he cannot see, and what does he say? The kingdom of God. And Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? He cannot enter in a second he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb, can he? So Nicodemus is thinking on a on a physical plane. He's thinking in the physical realm, isn't he? And then Jesus responds to him in verse 5 and repeats that phrase again. So if we could go back in time in, in this visitation at night, when, when Nicodemus comes to Jesus, we can get a sense of the sobriety of this conversation. 
This isn't a light conversation. This is a very, very sober, serious conversation. And we know that because Jesus repeats that unique phrase for the second time in this conversation. He says in verse 5, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Now, uh, theologians have different views on what, what water means. Probably the best indication of what that means, water and the Spirit, can be seen in Ezekiel chapter 36, verses 25 and 26. I'm not going to take the time to look at that now, but the whole idea is that water is a cleansing agent, or I'm sorry, yes, of course water is a cleansing cleansing agent, but water in scripture is often used symbolically. And the symbol of water points to a cleansing that has already taken place through repentance. That's what baptism is all about. The waters of baptism do not save us. And the waters of baptism don't even cleanse our sins. It's the blood of Jesus that cleanses us from our sins. It's faith in Jesus and his death, resurrection, and ascension. That's what, what brings us forgiveness. But the water in baptism is a symbol of what has already taken place at the cross. And then he says, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And so because a, a spiritual rebirth is a spiritual thing, Jesus is saying that there's the kingdom of God is a spiritual realm. It's not yet a physical realm, which Nicodemus and all the teachers of Israel were expecting it to be primarily a physical reign or solely a physical reign. We'll talk more about that later. I'd love to do more in John uh, chapter 3. Well, he says in verse 6, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed that I said to you, you must be born again. You must be born from above. You must be born of the Spirit. To enter into the kingdom of God, to have eternal life, does not um, hinge on one's Jewishness or on one keeping the law. There has to be a repentance and a belief in the Messiah and a reception of the Holy Spirit to awaken one's spirit, which is dead in our trespasses and sins, which we just read in Ephesians uh, chapter 2. Um, incidentally, Jesus goes on in verse um, 11 and says, Truly, truly, I say to you again, three times in just 11 verses, John is telling us that this conversation with, with Jesus calls Nicodemus the teacher of Israel, and he kind of chides Nicodemus by saying, how, how is it that you don't understand these things? You're the teacher of Israel and you don't understand these things? And so when Nicodemus heard Jesus use that phrase, amen, amen, or truly, truly, I say to you, and he's, and he's saying, I say to you, he's not quoting scripture, the... I would just give anything to have been a witness in that conversation. And the fact that this, this interview, if you will, takes place in John 3 is also very significant because that's the very beginning of John's gospel. Well, anyway, let's go to paragraph number 3 in your notes. Thus, the nature of the kingdom of God in this age, Jesus teaches, is not to come with irresistible power, but with an offer of grace. And that is what threw Nicodemus. The Jews were expecting the kingdom of God to come with irresistible force and power. It will, but not in this age. And yet, yet, beloved, men can still reject that offer of grace. It's astonishing. 
But such is the gift of man's free will. God will not force anyone into his kingdom, unlike earthly kings who rule, especially then, who ruled through force and fear of imprisonment or death. But Jesus will never force anyone uh, to submit to his reign. Isn't that true? It must be voluntary. It has to be a voluntary um, entrance. That brings me to paragraph number four. The kingdom of God is therefore a spiritual reign. It is a spiritual reign. However, it has tangible, positive effects in the natural realm for those who submit to that reign, with the result that even unbelievers are positively affected. Case in point, when we carry ourselves differently than sinners, when we walk in humility, when we walk in forgiveness, when we walk in purity and in holiness, they see a difference in our lives. Isn't that true? Years ago when I worked in, um, in the secular world, um, I was in outside sales in the Silicon Valley. I worked for a company called Hall Kenyon, and that was my mission field. And even though I was a full-time minister at the time, what I was doing at the time was, was ministry. That was a mission field. And that doesn't mean that I used that mission field to preach the gospel nonstop to everyone. <laughs> I earned the right to preach the gospel, if you will, by, by being better than everybody else, by performing better than everyone else. And I didn't engage in their crude jokes and their off-color humor. I prayed earnestly for their salvation every single day. Now, I was there able to share the gospel with people, and my fellow co-workers knew that I was a Christian. But three years later, when, when, I, um, when I resigned from that position to go back in outside sales, they gave a, a going away party for me. And a young woman that I never worked directly with, I'd never shared the gospel with her, <clears throat> pulled me aside privately. And she said to me, she said, you know what I appreciate about you is you don't just talk the talk, you walk the walk. Now that, that was like a badge of honor to me. Again, because here I had never shared the gospel with her. I never really even had many conversations with her. In my conversations, I don't recall that I said anything about God. But she watched my life, and she saw that something was entirely different. What was she seeing, beloved? She was seeing a demonstration of someone who walks in the kingdom of God, who submits to that spiritual reign, and she's used to the kingdom of man. There's a, there's a major difference between the two. And she recognized the importance of the of the kingdom of God, the power of the kingdom of God, and, and it had a positive effect on her. That is why the kingdom of God is so important and it can influence the unsaved. Let me just say to those of you who are pastors and leaders in Kenya, encourage your people with this truth that no matter what it is that we're doing in life, whether we whether we are a full-time minister or, or a, a mom that stays at home or we work some sort of a job, whether it's farming or selling products or whatever it is, listen, loved ones, whatever God calls us to, that is meaningful work. That is, we're called to glorify God with our work. That is a calling that we have. So encourage your people in that. Don't make them think that because you're a minister, you're more important than them. They, not everybody is called to be a full-time minister, are they? Most people are not. But work is, is something that we can do to glorify God. And work is something that, we can, that God can use to give us a platform to share the gospel. You as a minister are not going to run into most of those people. But they will. And as you encourage them... Uh, to walk in integrity and, and to be the best at what they do and, and to bless those that don't know him, that will make a difference and you'll see growth in your church as well. Amen? Well, 
Let's go on to paragraph number five. Accordingly, the spiritual reign of the kingdom of God is a mighty witness in this age to the unsaved who are offered eternal entrance into this kingdom by grace through faith in Jesus. I've already gone over that. That brings me to paragraph number six. In the thousand year reign of Jesus on this earth, which we can read about in Revelation 20, um, in all of Revelation 20, we'll get there in just a moment. The kingdom of God will clearly, decisively, and finally rule the nations in the best sense of the term. The result will be righteousness, peace, and justice. No more wars, none of that. For that, turn with me, if you will, to um, Isaiah chapter 2. And hold your place in Revelation 20, uh, if, you're, if you're already there. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 2. We're going to look at a couple places in Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 2. And verses 1 through 4. I cannot wait for this day to come. And I'm sure you feel the same way as well. So we read uh, in Isaiah chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, the word which Isaiah the son of Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. Now it will come about that in the last days the mountain of the house of Yahweh will be established as the chief of the mountains. This is a, Mountain is a metaphor for a, a government or for a nation, for authority. Uh, it will be established as the chief of the mountains and will be raised above the hills. And all the nations will stream to it. This is the Gentiles. The Hebrew word for nations is goyim, which is the Gentiles. And many peoples will come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of Yahweh. The, the mountain here is Jerusalem. Uh, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us concerning his ways and that we may walk in his paths. There's going to be such a move of God in the end times, probably after the tribulation, that the people will turn in, in droves to, uh, to Jesus Christ. For the law will go forth from Zion. The Hebrew word translated law is Torah, which is simply teaching or instruction. I don't know why the translators always translate it law, because it's, it's the teaching or the instruction of Yahweh. Only a small amount of, of Genesis through uh, Deuteronomy is actually law. A lot of it is just the teaching of Yahweh. For the Torah will go forth from Zion and the word of Yahweh from Jerusalem. Notice the result now in verse 4. And he will judge between the nations and will render decisions for many peoples. Why is that important? Is because under man's rule and reign, uh, error is made all the time in courts of justice. We don't always have the right decisions. Uh, the decisions of rulers and reign, uh, those who rule and reign are oftentimes ungodly. And so, so Jesus will step in and will judge between the nations, verse 4, and will render decisions for many peoples. And notice the result. They will hammer their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not lift up sword against nation and never again will they learn war. That, loved ones, is incredibly good news, isn't it? I am so weary of terrorism. And I know that you and Kenya are weary of terrorism as well, aren't you? Uh, these terrorists are demons. They are just, they're they're in league with Adolf Hitler. They are so wicked and so evil. And we wonder how can human beings stoop to that level? But the great news is the day is coming when that will be a distant memory and, and everlasting righteousness will be ushered in. 
Praise God, O Pakruoth, amen? Nyesai Duong, that is, uh, God is great. Nyesai Bear, God is good. Amen. Praise God. Well, then turn with me, if you will, to Isaiah chapter 11, and we're going to look at verses 6 through 9. Isaiah 11 and verses 6 through 9. These are the conditions of, of society at this time uh, in what is most likely the thousand-year reign of Jesus Christ on this earth in complete peace, justice, and righteousness. That is, this is when the kingdom of God comes in physically and naturally as well as spiritually. So right now, the kingdom of God is a spiritual reign, which is entered into by faith through those who trust in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. But it's not always going to remain only a spiritual reign. It will be a physical reign as well. And, and, and here's what the physical reign <clears throat> is going to look like in Isaiah 11, verses 6 through 9. This is so exciting, I can barely sit down. And the wolf will dwell with the lamb. And the leopard will lie down with the young goat. And the calf and the young lion and the fatling together. And a little boy will lead them. Also the cow and the bear will graze. Their young will lie down together. And the lion will eat straw like the ox. You all have, you have Maasai Mara. And in that region of the world, all of the, um, uh, what do you call them? The... Um, uh, safari areas and I was able I've only been able to go once in my five trips to Kenya but to see that wildlife and and to see kills uh, fresh kills that is going to end one day also the cow verse 7 and the bear will graze their young will lie down together the lion will eat straw like the ox the nursing child will play by the hole of the cobra and the weaned child will put his hand on the viper's den. They will not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth will be full of the knowledge of Yahweh as the waters cover the sea. This is in the word of God. There is going to be such a fundamental change throughout the earth that there will no longer be enmity between one person and, and another person or one nation and another nation, one tribe and another tribe. And there will not even be animosity or fear between man and the animal kingdom. That is something to celebrate, isn't it? But before that, those who are going to lead in that kingdom have to be submitted to the king of the kingdom. And that is in part what the parables are all about. They are teaching us how to live as citizens of the kingdom. That brings me to paragraph number seven. One of my favorite commentators, I've uh, got his book up there. So I was going to show you my book, The Gospel of the Kingdom, by George Eldon Ladd, and I'm going to uh, give a quote from him in just a minute. But the other thing I, I have, this is a small picture of, of a, uh, I have a large painting, I don't know how well this will come out on, on the video, but I have a large painting downstairs. Uh, from the 1800s of what the kingdom of God is going to look like. You see the little boy leading uh, the animals and there's complete peace between the animals. You've got uh, the, the lamb uh, dwelling with the near the lion. Um, actually, right behind the lamb is a wolf. The wolf and the lamb will uh, dwell together. Uh, there's the lion, there's the calf. And um, what you can, I don't know if you can see this, but in the background are man's kingdoms going up in smoke. You have uh, the Roman, 
Roman architecture, the Roman Empire is in ruins, and um, you have the city of Babylon going up in smoke. Um, here's a leopard right here. I hope you can see that. And um, there's death in the background. But as, as the kingdom of God is advancing, life is starting to, you see flowers. And so life is starting to spring up. There's a palm branch uh, signifying praise to Jesus. I, I just love this, this picture of what the kingdom of God is going to look like. Well, anyway, that brings me to paragraph number seven in your notes. George, El George Eldon Ladd writes well that the millennium, that is the thousand year reign of Jesus, will be the period of the manifestation of Christ's glory. That is, he will have come back to this earth. If the age to come is thought of as existing beyond history, the millennium will witness the triumph of God's kingdom within history. Within history, paragraph number seven. That's a great quote. The age to come um, is something that we can read about in Revelation 21 and 22, but the millennium, the thousand year reign of Jesus on this earth, is, is actually going to happen within history. Now that leads us to paragraph number eight in your notes. It will then be both a spiritual and natural or physical kingdom. And this is why uh, Princeton theologian Gerhard Vos referred to the kingdom as already, but not yet. Again, that's paragraph number eight. The kingdom of God is already, but not yet. That is, the kingdom of God is here, but it's not here in its fullness. Jesus proclaimed the kingdom. We'll see that when we get to the parables. The parables teach about the nature of the kingdom. We are in the kingdom. I, I had us look at Romans 14, 17 um, last time. The kingdom of God is not eating or drinking, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. But the kingdom is not yet here in its fullness. We are still in this evil age. Paragraph 9, man's day of ruling his own kingdoms in rebellion against God. Psalm 2, I would recommend that you read that, will have finally come and gone, just as Daniel chapter 2, uh, verses 31 through 45 prophesies. Please pause the video at this point and take time to go through Psalm 2. It isn't very many verses, about eight verses, I think or 11 verses, and then go through Daniel 2, uh, 31 through 40, uh, 45. Pause the video, go through that, so that you can get that Old Testament teaching in your heart. It's very important that you do that. Okay, so please pause now and, and go through that. All right, now that you've come back, uh, paragraph number 10, however, even in this perfect millennial reign of Jesus from Jerusalem, unrighteous men will coexist with the righteous, yet without the temptations of Satan, who will be locked in the abyss for that duration, for the entire thousand years. So with that, turn with me to Revelation chapter 20. Revelation uh, chapter 20, and let's read verses 1 through 3. Revelation 20 and verses 1 through 3. This is at the end of the tribulation. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding the key of the abyss, which is a temporary place of torment, and a great chain in his hand. I can't wait to see that. And he laid hold of the dragon. He laid hold of Satan himself. I cannot wait to see that. The serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan. The, the Greek word devil is uh, diabolos, and it means slanderer. When we slander other people, we're doing the work of the devil. And Satan comes from the Old Testament in Job and in Zechariah. 
and it's pronounced in Hebrew Satan, which means adversary, who resists and opposes. He is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. One thousand years. And he threw him into the abyss and shut it and sealed it over him so that he would not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were completed. After these things, he must be released for a short time. And John doesn't tell us how long that is. He just says it's a short time. So let's go on. Hold your place in Revelation 20. Let's go on to paragraph number 11. Nevertheless, to demonstrate how wicked unregenerate men can be, even during Jesus' perfect reign on earth, some, and maybe even many, will only feign or pretend obedience to him, showing their true colors at the end of that earthly reign. So let's, let's read verses 4 through 10. Uh, John says, Then I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was given to them. Them is us. We are going to judge the unsaved and even angels during this period. A good reference there would be 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 1 through 3. We're not going to be judging independent of the Father and the Son. We're going to be judging along with the Father and the Son. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony of Jesus and because of the word of God. And those who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received the mark on their forehead and on their hand. And they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. That is all of those who have placed their faith in Jesus. Not just that category, because if you look at Daniel chapter 7 and Daniel chapter 9 and uh, Revelation 2 uh, verses 25 through 27, Revelation 5 verse 10, Matthew 5 verses, uh, verse 3 I think it is, 3 through 5, over and over and over in the Word of God, you, you, we find that... Um, that God is teaching us and training us to rule and reign with him. But first, we have to understand how his kingdom operates. That's what the parables are all about. Paragraph 5, the rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were completed. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who has a part in the first resurrection. Over these, the second death has no power. The second death would be that that. Um, you know, man, man dies a normal, natural death, but that doesn't mean he ceases to exist. He spends those men outside of Christ are go immediately to Hades. Those of us who die in Christ go immediately to heaven. The second death is when they're cast into the lake of fire, and in John will say that uh, shortly. He says, he says, verse six: the second death has no power, but they speaking of us, will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign for him, with him for a thousand years, repeating it twice for emphasis. When the thousand years are completed, verse 7, Satan will be released from his prison. Earlier in, in verse 3, at the end of verse 3, John already tells us it's for a short time. And will come out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together for the war. The number of them is like the sand of the seashore. This is just absolutely astonishing. It's almost too difficult to take in because these are people who prospered under the millennial reign of Jesus and lived in complete peace, justice, and righteousness no wars, none of that. And yet their hearts were so wicked that they only pretended obedience to him, but their hearts were never right with him. You see, even in this thousand years, he will not force people to serve him. He will never force people to love him. 
People have to do that by through conversion. And then here it is in verse 9. They came up on the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city, that's Jerusalem, and fire came down from heaven and devoured them. And the devil, verse 10, who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire, also known as Gehenna, and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are also. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. A good reference there for you will be Matthew 25 verses 31 through 46 where Jesus teaches on, on on all of this they would not receive forgiveness for their sins they would not repent of their sins and so they're going to have to face a holy righteous God because of their, their deep seated rebellion and get what they deserve it's not God's fault it's not your fault or my fault. It's their fault. They lived in the presence of Jesus for a thousand years. They heard his teaching. They saw how we lived and they still, that's how rotten man's heart is apart from the grace of God. Aren't you glad that we've been saved and delivered from our sins? Well, that leads me to paragraph number 25. This finally and completely will reveal man's true fallen nature. He will have no excuse before God for his rebellious state. Paragraph 13, it's then that the devil is destroyed by Jesus in Gehenna. And after that, the final judgment takes place and the eternal state, the age to come, is inaugurated. And you can read those, read about that in verses 11 through 15 of Revelation 20. Now let me quickly add that the biblical idea of being destroyed does not mean to annihilate. It does not mean that someone ceases to exist. We just read that in Revelation 20 verse 10. They will be tormented day and night forever and ever. You can't torment someone that doesn't exist any longer. I'm emphasizing that because we have teaching going on in the United States. It's been going on for a long, long time called annihilationalism. And um, it means that, that at a certain determined period of time, God just causes those people to escape hell and they just cease to exist. That's not what the Bible teaches. So it does not mean, paragraph 14, to annihilate. Instead, it means that the Greek word means that one comes to utter ruin of all that is valuable. That's what that Greek word means. In English, the word destroy can have the connotation to cease to exist. But we're not reading the Bible in English, we're reading the Bible in Greek. And the Greek is translated into English, and, and you can't always have a translation that is a precise translation. And that's where my job as a teacher is to bring that out and make it clear. Paragraph 15, Satan will live forever and suffer in ways we cannot imagine as he pays an eternal price for what he has done to all of humanity. I cannot wait to see that day. I'm sure you feel the same way. Paragraph 16, returning to our discussion of the kingdom, another Old Testament scholar, John Bright, puts it best when he defines the kingdom this way. He writes, it involves the whole notion of the rule of God over his people and particularly the vindication of that rule and people in glory at the end of history. And that's what we just read in Revelation 20 and you see even more of it in Revelation 21 and 22 which I encourage you to read. Paragraph 17, although it appears insignificant now, it is nevertheless real and it is destined to dominate the whole world. God will someday rule over all. That's what the kingdom is all about. 
In paragraph 18, Ladd adds, the biblical idea of the kingdom of God is deeply rooted in the Old Testament and is grounded in the confidence that there is one eternal living God who has revealed himself to men and who has a purpose for the human race which he has, has chosen to accomplish through the nation of Israel. Now I mentioned earlier that the frustration of all believers in Jesus now is the domination of sin and the deep ongoing activity of Satan in this age. He is the God of this age. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Let me just read that. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 4. In whose case the God of this world or this age, that Greek word can mean this age, has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. That verse is outstanding for when we get to the parable of the sower. Satan has blinded the minds of the unbelieving. That is, if they don't respond with all they have to the word of God, Satan comes and snatches the seed that was sown in them. So the frustration of all believers in, in Jesus now is the domination of sin and the, and the ongoing deep-seated activity of Satan in this age. Their hope, that is our hope, is its total absence in the age to come. John prophesies that in Revelation 11. I want to read that um, as well because the Word of God is so powerful. It gives us hope. And, and promise. Revelation 11 and verse 15. Even before it happens, John, John um, in, in his vision uh, quotes this. Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. Can you hear that? Can you hear the booming voices of, of that declaration? And do you know that we're going to see that and hear it with our own eyes one day? We are so blessed. Now, paragraph number 20, koro, koro means now or so, both the Old Testament and the New Testament have a great deal to say about the kingdom of God. Two critically important verses which summarize the Old Testament teaching on the kingdom of God, paragraph 21, can be found in Isaiah 2, verse 4, which we already read, and Isaiah 11, verses 6 through 9, which we also already read. They are the promise that God's kingdom will reign on the earth in complete peace, justice, and righteousness. And then that leads us to our new section, or our next se section. Um, we're getting really close to getting into the parables. Jesus, the kingdom, and the parables about the kingdom. That's our next uh, section.